Several years ago, I made a couple of videos about forgotten RPGs. Now I'm back with what could be considered as the definitive list, 10 forgotten JRPGs, the most forgotten of them all, by their fans, by their developers, and by their publishers. Do these games deserve to be forgotten? Well, we're about to find out, so let's begin! Number 10. Alondra Alondra's popularity back in the late 90s was mainly thanks to working designs. They had gained considerable following thanks to their localizations of JRPGs. They also became infamous, sadly, for taking a lot of liberties, making drastic changes to them and increasing their difficulty. Alondra was one of those cases, like almost every single game they localized. But that's not the point. The point is, this little action RPG had attained commercial success in Japan, so the possibility of succeeding overseas was high. It did, to an extent, even without a big marketing budget, and I remember a lot of people bringing this game up in conversations about PS1 JRPGs. Alondra, however, was quite challenging, full of cryptic puzzles. There weren't a lot of people out there who had beaten the game, therefore increasing its popularity or infamy. Eventually, it started fading away for several reasons. One, that level of cryptiness did not sit well with a lot of gamers. Two, working designs never did any proper aftermarketing. Three, ignorant buyers and surface dwellers called it a Zelda clone. Like, seriously? Four, it got a sequel that got mixed to negative reviews. And five, the series died right after that. Does it deserve to be forgotten? No way! It may not have been the most innovative game ever, but its uniqueness and dark storytelling earned it a place in history very well deserved. Number 9. White Knight Chronicles 1 and 2 I'm including both games since it's pretty much part 1 and 2, the same game, the second one being a very direct sequel, little to no point in playing it without playing the first one. Fortunately, you can buy its physical release still for a decent price nowadays, which includes a remastered version of the first one. That's why you often see this one in stores for dirt cheap, no one bothers with it. They were Level 5's most ambitious project back then during the hype of MMORPGs. Except these weren't MMORPGs, but they played like some with that combat similar to Final Fantasy XII. However, they lacked the stellar storytelling of other JRPGs, including previous Level 5 games. They were also victims of Sony's greed, always wanting to make everything a AAA experience comparable to Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest. So what killed this series was pretty much both Sony's and people's heavenly expectations for them. Not even their online multiplayer saved them from oblivion, especially not the little prequel Sony released on PSP, which only came out in Europe and Japan. So, does White Knight Chronicles deserve to be forgotten? No, I don't think so, but this is a game I understand why people forget about it. It's great, sure, but not historically important, nor is it among the best action RPGs on the PS3. Number 8. Tales of the World of Radiant Mythology I bet you have already forgotten about this game, huh? Most Tales fans remember all the Tales games, even the ones they haven't even played. Whether their reputation is positive or negative, people know about them. This one was pretty much ignored, despite being a crossover of the Tales series, with a customizable protagonist and several characters across the series joining your party. Many Tales crossovers were released on the PSP, to ultimate mediocrity. They weren't bad at all, but they weren't outstanding either. We only got this one, Bandai Namco testing the waters to see if there was enough interest. Well, there wasn't. Especially because in 2007, when it was localized, the Tale series was nowhere, and I mean nowhere near as popular as it is right now overseas. I'd say Namco gave up pretty easily, and perhaps it should have waited a few more years to release these crossovers worldwide. Is this one a good game? It is. I love the fact that I could have some of my favorite Tales characters in my party. Unfortunately, the majority of the Tales games are better. 
This one has controls and combat that aren't great with an interface that could easily be improved nowadays. It kinda deserves to be forgotten, but I'd like to hope for a remaster or remake one day, or merely a new Tales crossover with much better gameplay. Number 7. Shining Force CD Why this duology was forgotten is very easy. Released on the Sega CD, an unsuccessful add-on that most people never cared about. What is this, you ask? Believe it or not, they are two direct sequels to the original Shining Force on the Sega Genesis. They were initially released on Sega's first portable system, the Game Gear, supposed to compete against the Game Boy. Yeah, it didn't stand a chance, of course. I have no idea why Sega decided to localize only the second game, known here as the Sword of Haja. In Japan, they're known as Gaiden 1 and 2. So we got Gaiden 2, and nobody understood anything about its story, cause it was a direct sequel to Gaiden 1, which was a direct sequel to Shining Force 1. Messy, right? And for these games to be released exclusively to systems destroyed by Nintendo's competition, were they popular back then? No, that's the issue. They weren't for the aforementioned reasons. People just knew there were more Shining Force games out there, but never knew they were connected. Are they any good? Yes, they are! They play just as good as the original game, and they continue the story with the kids from it. I strongly believe they should never be forgotten, and maybe someone could remind Sega to bring them back to any console, or collection, or whatever. People need to know about this. And speaking about Shining Force... Number 6. Shining Force Exa The previous games were developed by the usual studio, Camelot Software Planning, back then known as Sonic Software Planning. Not this one. After the Shining Force 3 fiasco on the Sega Saturn, Camelot quit Sega and joined Nintendo. But they didn't have the rights anymore to the series, so they couldn't continue. Sega did, so they started rebooting the series over and over again to no avail. First they released Shining Soul 1 and 2 for the Game Boy Advance to a commercial and critical failure. Then a company called Neverland came along to develop Shining Force Neo, also to a commercial failure. You know Neverland, right? Mostly known for creating Lufia and Rune Factory? Yep. Well, Sega gave them one last chance and Shining Force Exa was the result. A great action RPG with some Diablo point of view and Musou style of combat, fighting hordes of enemies, just like Neo, but much better. Even the story and characters were better. People knew this game, not Neo, and spoke about it. Fans still wanted their strategy RPGs back then, but as an action RPG, this one was fine, a good spin off. But it didn't meet the company's expectations despite selling well in Japan. So goodbye, Neverland, thanks for everything. Sega did not forget about this game, however. They will lend Soma and Cyril, the game's main characters, to be playable in Project Cross Zone. Exa is fine nowadays as a hidden gem, it doesn't really deserve to be forgotten, but it's just not what Shining Force fans wanted back then, and probably never will. Number 5. Blue Dragon I think most of you do remember this one, it's no surprise, it was a huge deal back then for being the first JRPG by Hironobu Sakaguchi, right after controversially leaving Squaresoft. Nobuo Uematsu did the music, and Akira Toriyama the character design. Yeah, huge project! It was commercially successful, there was a 51 episodes anime based on it, and released pretty much simultaneously with the game. It also spawned two direct sequels on the Nintendo DS, but that's when things went to hell. First and foremost, critics weren't so polite, their expectations were skyrocketing because what could you expect about three geniuses in the RPG industry? Blue Dragon was great, but felt slightly generic and with not much to offer. Then there's the fact that it was released for a console most RP gamers worldwide didn't really care for. Then it's two direct sequels released for a portable Nintendo system now? It gets worse. The second game, Blue Dragon Plus, had drastically changed in gameplay. It was now a real-time strategy RPG. Lame, forgettable, repetitive and boring. The third one, Awakened Shadow, was now an action RPG. Pretty decent, to be honest, I do recommend this one, but honestly, they felt more like spin-offs despite continuing the story we saw in the original game. All these decisions made Miss Walker realize her errors. 
forcing them to look at the mobile market instead. Blue Dragon should never be forgotten, instead it should be a reminder of what NOT to do with a brand new IP created by some of the big names in the industry. Number 4, Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals. Actually, I'd like to start talking about whole sagas here from now on. Lufia was 6 games total, most of them to lower sales and mixed reviews. In fact, people only seem to remember the first two on the Super Nintendo. I don't like the first game one bit, but I think most people do. Its prequel, Rise of the Sinistrals, is however the best in the series, an excellent RPG and I think the majority of its fans agree. They've been forgotten because almost every game is owned by a different company. Taito, Natsume, Atlus, and even Square Enix. The latter published a remake of Lufia 2 on the Nintendo DS, but obviously they changed it into an action RPG that most fans and critics alike trashed. It isn't a terrible game, I'd like to say, but it's not great, let's leave it at that. What most people don't know is the other three games. Lufia The Legend Returns was released on the Game Boy Color to low sales as yet another prequel to the first Lufia. Its events set the tables for it though, but it was confusing because the first Lufia had never been released in Europe. So over there, it was a prequel to nothing! Along came Lufia The Ruins of Lore in the Game Boy Advance, a fairly mediocre and forgettable spin-off. It wasn't released in Europe. Another spin-off was there for phones only in Japan based on Lufia 2. Obviously Lufia 2 will always be remembered by its fans, bought by its developers and publishers. Nope, not after the rest of the series consisted of OK games that were no real competition whatsoever to most of the greater JRPGs back then. Number 3, Fantasy Star Universe. Again, let me speak for the whole saga. It's what came right after the huge commercial success of Fantasy Star Online. Sega took some criticism to heart when they heard that the offline story mode for those games was lacking. And yeah, it was. So they wanted to make a new saga where story mode actually mattered and felt like normal action RPGs. So they released two games for the PS2 and Xbox 360, later two more, namely Part 3 and 4, as Fantasy Star Portable on the PSP. A fifth game was there as well, but it was pretty much an expanded version of the fourth one, released exclusively in Japan. I'm a fan of this saga despite its mixed and average reviews. No one thought it was awesome back then, barely anyone praised it, but the saga still persevered with four games and an expansion until it properly concluded which means it was successful and well received at least in Japan. It sold a lot overseas too though, and I do believe they're among the best action JRPGs of their generation. However, there was a lot of confusion back then overseas with most people thinking they were merely online games. White Knight Chronicles had a similar issue by the way. I think they were erroneously advertised as such, so gamers couldn't tell if they were regular RPGs that could be played offline as any other or not. In no way should this saga be forgotten, it was part of the series' history as a different approach to the online multiplayer craze from back then, pretty much as Sega's attempt to convince fans they could still make good stories and offline story modes in the series. I personally recommend the whole saga. Number 2, Atelier Iris 1 and 2. Let me explain to you something very important about Atelier. You think they're all cheesy and girly games with colorful stories and magical girls mostly focused on quests and synthesis? You're wrong. There was a trilogy and two spin-offs that weren't exactly like that. Manakimia 1 and 2 were more obscure, so if people forgot about them it's probably because they didn't even know about them. However, Atelier Iris 1 and 2, you can forget about the third one because it isn't great to be honest, were popular back then. Sure, their synthesis, alchemy, gathering items, colorful worlds, etc., but they're regular adventure RPGs with a lot of traditional elements. You play these two games and then jump into something like Risa or Rorona, trust me, you'll notice the huge difference in both gameplay and storytelling. Like I said, they were traditional styled RPGs going from town to town, saving the world, yeah. So why were they forgotten? 
With all these remasters and ports of most Atelier games, why isn't Ghost, the developers, doing anything with these three? Probably because Nice America has the rights, whereas most Atelier games after those are owned by Koei Tecmo. Fans forgot about this trilogy because the Atelier formula drastically changed after Grand Phantasm, which was already starting to feel like future titles, and the series was commercially successful after that. Do not forget these two, my friend, they're great games, among the best in the series, and they do stand out precisely for being different than most of the other Atelier titles out there. Number 1. Ark the Lath Half of the games in this series deserve to be forgotten, I'm not gonna lie. The other half, though, should always be remembered, even by non-strategy RPG fans. Ark the Lad was huge in Japan, most games sold really well in there, and it became a staple in the genre. Why a staple? Because back in 1995, there weren't a lot of tactical RPGs to compete against Fire Emblem and Shining Force. Sony nailed it with this series, and working designs helped with that, of course, but it was already too late. By the time they localized the first four games, the three main titles in the spin-off, in a collection on the PS1, it was already 2002. Final Fantasy Tactics was huge, Vandal Hearts was out there, another forgotten game by the way, Fire Emblem was about to get its first Western release, and this Gaia was just around the corner. Not to say the collection was quite pricey from the start, most people couldn't afford it or didn't want to because they had instead their eyes on PlayStation 2 games. PS1 time was at its end. So yeah, way too late to establish Ark the Lab as a true staple in the genre overseas. A year later, Sony released Twilight of the Spirits, an excellent game that rebooted the saga with a different story, cast and universe. Sure, it sold well worldwide, but people forgot about it. In fact, I think it's the best Ark the Lad out there, but the most forgotten of them all. Because what came afterwards was literal bullshit! End of Darkness was no longer a strategy RPG, but a lame-ass, weird, clunky, boring and cringe-worthy action RPG. The series died, obviously. The game was a commercial failure and critical disgrace. Ark the Lad did not return until 2018 with a mobile free-to-play game. You guessed it, no one cared for it. It deserves to be forgotten like End of Darkness. Ark the Lad Collection and Twilight of the Spirits, however, are a different story. The first games are very important to history, as being the first ones to really compete against the tactical giants in Japan. Any sort of re-release of these games nowadays will be more than ideal, so people can remember them and never ever forget. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of JRPGs out there that are also forgotten. Some of these games are already hidden gems, when back in the day they weren't hidden gems at all, everybody knew them. But nowadays, forgotten, hidden gems, underrated, whatever you want to call them. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe and share this video with your friends. See you next time!